the ingredients of building. Today you don't have a very loud voice. Please shout louder. The ingredients of building. That's the sermon series we've been looking at. Last Sunday I was not here. Pastor Mary was here. And I can tell she blessed your socks off. Isn't it? And it was good to have your mother here. You'd really missed her, isn't it? Amazing. So, <clears throat> we've looked at unity of heart, which is the first ingredient. There must be unity. Secondly, we, had looked at, or we have looked at having the mind to work, which is another ingredient. And today, I want to look at uh, the third ingredient. But before I do so, let's just read Genesis chapter 11 from verse 1. The Bible says, now the whole earth had one language. Somebody shout one language. And one speech, shout one speech. one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of China and they dwelt there. Then they say to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now today I want us to look at the next ingredient, which is the language of the kingdom. Somebody say, the language of the kingdom. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you speak to us. Let your word explode in our spirits. I pray that may you shift us to the next level. Let us understand deeply what the ingredients of building, you know, building your house, building your kingdom, establish your, establishing your kingdom here on earth is all about. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shout aloud, amen. Now, today there are over 7,000 living languages in the world, according to the study anylanguage.com. Asia is considered to be having over 2,200 languages. Africa, where we belong, is over 2,000 languages. America is over 400 languages. Europe has 24 official languages. Kenya, where we live, uh, has over 50 languages. You can see that in a country of about 45 to 50 million people, there are so many languages which are very, very different. That's why if you're not a Kikuyu and you're around Kikuyus and they're speaking Kikuyu, you can't understand what they're saying. If you're around Luos and you're not a Luo and they're speaking Luo, you will not understand what they're saying. If you're around Merus, and they are speaking Kimeru, you think they are, they are fighting. <laughs> but they are actually communicating with one another, isn't it? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> one time I was around Kambas and they were talking, and I was trying to imagine how their tongue was. Because as they were talking, I thought their tongue is very slimy. It's just like, just flowing. <laughs> I mean, when you're around different tribes, you know, as much as they're Kenyans like you, it's, it's very difficult to really understand what they're talking about if you don't belong to that tribe. In fact, sometimes, you know, the only way you can be able to, like, lock people out of a conversation is by speaking in your mother tongue, especially if you know that they don't belong to your tribe. Have you ever been in a place where people are just speaking their mother tongue? It's like you are not even there. You're even trying to lift your hand to tell them, hey, guys, I'm here. But they don't care. They go deep and they are laughing. They are giving each other high turn. You know, some of them are laughing until they are rolling on the floor. And you're just looking at them. It's like they have cut you from that conversation. And they don't want to be, to be part of that conversation. I went to another country one time for the first time. The country begins with an S. And I was so amazed how those guys were so absorbed in their native language that I could preach. And after I preached, we were seated around the table having dinner with the pastors, the host pastors, some leaders, and, and, and some invited pastors from other churches. And they just almost immediately switch in their native language. And I'm there as a guest speaker. 
and I'm just looking at them as they are talking, and they're not even getting the message. The way I'm looking at them, you know, there's a way you look at somebody, even without talking. You know, you're just saying, hey, you guys, what are you doing? I'm here. And they were laughing. And I'm just looking at them. They are laughing. Some of them are standing, giving each other high five across the table. So when people speak in a foreign language and, and you're around there, it's, it's very difficult for you to understand what they are talking about. Now, you need to understand that every language has some significance. Say that with me. Every language has some significance. When you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 7 to 11, the Bible says, even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise, you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. They are, it may be, so many kind of language, kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. That's why I told you every language has some significance. In those days, they used to use musical instruments to communicate. When a trumpet was blown, the way it was blown was to either gather people together or to declare war against the enemy. And so if the language that is used around you is foreign to you, you'll be lost. You don't know the next cause of action. You don't know how to respond. You don't know how to react because you don't know how to interpret or to under, you're not able to understand the language that has been used. So every language has some significance. Every language conveys a message and it can be a coded message. If you don't understand the language, you will not know how to react. Let's just practice. Can you just tell the neighbor who is seated next to you that you really, really love them with the love of Christ in your native language? Why are people laughing? Did you understand a word they said? So if your neighbor actually abused you, you don't know. You're assuming your neighbor said what I have already said in a known language, isn't it? That's why I'm saying every language has some significance. Every language communicates something. So if you don't understand the language, no matter what is said, you will not understand. And so you will not be able to actually react to what you hear because you don't understand what that language conveys to you. Now, every language forms a bond within a group of people. That's why when you go to, to a place and you're looking kind of lost, you know, and for example, you are from Nyanza, and then you hear some people speak in Doluo. All of a sudden, you start feeling at home. True or not true? Or if you go to a place, it's a new place, it's a new neighborhood, or it's a, um, it's, it's a new, uh, it's a new uh, office that you have joined, you know, and everybody looks like they're committed to what they're doing, they're busy walking around, and you're just there feeling like a very small, tiny guy in this big, huge company, and then all of a sudden, somebody switches in a language that you understand. All of a sudden, you start relaxing. You start saying in your heart, at least my brother is here. At least my sister is here. At least my relatives are in this 
place. So a language forms a bond within a group of people. A language connects individuals because they are able to understand each other easily. When you go to a foreign land, you know sometimes when we travel, you know, uh, to America, we go to different places. Sometimes we go to purely white areas, or areas that are full of white people, let me use that. And of course, when you get there, you, you just have to switch. You have to switch and you start speaking English. You speak in the language that they, um, they understand. And so you struggle with the English. And sometimes you speak English and they say, but, pardon, what did you say? Pardon, what did you say? And sometimes it can be very frustrating. I remember one time I went somewhere and I was speaking and, and the pastor kept on saying, what? While I'm preaching. <laughs> Say, what? When I mentioned some words, he kept on saying, what? For example, one time I was, I was, I was, I was preaching for the book, from the book of uh, Samuel. So I said, first Samuel. I said, what? I said, first Samuel. I said, what? <laughs> then I say, S A M W E L. I said, oh, Samuel. <laughs> it was very difficult. So you have to adapt so that as you are talking, they understand what you're talking about. You understand what I'm saying. So every language has some significance. Languages make people understand each other easily. One time we, we, went, we went to UK for an exchange program in 1993, and we were around white people for three, three for almost three, actually it was three weeks, around ra ra white people, three weeks. You know? you know, I was around white people so much that when I came, back. I realize truly Africa is a dark continent. It's very dark. It's just so black people. <laughs> anyway, when we were there for around three weeks, around white people, uh, they were taking us different places to visit sites and, and, and stuff like that. I remember there was this particular day, I think the last few weeks just before we came back, they took us to this community. Uh, the community had invited us because they were told that these are guys from Kenyans, from Kenya, and so this community invited us for, for lunch. And so we went to this community for lunch. There was a lot of food. Let me tell you, these countries in the West, they have a lot of food. Yeah. Food is from one end to another. You have to be careful. <laughs> Especially if you come from scarcity backgrounds. You have to be very, very careful. Amen. One day, remind me, I'll give you the story of what happened to me. You love hearing my stories. I realize I embarrass myself a lot before these people. You guys, don't, you don't fear the anointing. <laughs> anyway, I was from this rural area. I've gone to this country. And for me, I grew up knowing you only have one meal. Yeah, it's Ugali and Skumawiki, and if God has blessed you, there is meat. And sometimes the meat, you look for it. <laughs> it's not easy to find it. Isn't it? I think you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, and sometimes when you eat and you don't feel like you are, you are, you are satisfied, if you go to the kitchen, they tell you, brother, yeah, that's all we had. Yeah. Look for anything else to drink, but there's nothing here for you. You understand? Then I'm going to this country, and this country, they have what we call a five-course meal, and I'm hungry. And they bring the appetizer, soup, and some scones, and their sconces are very nice. I mean, I cleared almost all the scones <laughs> and the soup. What do you mean? I'm hungry. Cleared everything. They were bringing, I clear, I bring, I clear. I think the person who was bringing was surprised. What's wrong with this person? 
Then when I was full, they brought the food. I said, this is unfair. And I was too full, I couldn't even eat. Then after that, they brought the dessert. I was just looking as they were bringing all these nice things. <laughs> then after that, they brought tea. Since then, I learned a lesson. So anyway, we were in this community. And in this, some of you are laughing at me, but you are just like me. <laughs> It's only that you have not traveled. But if you travel, you make the same mistake. But maybe because I've said you will, you'll be wiser. So we're in this community. I'm used to seeing just white people 100% of the time. And we're in this community. We are eating. Then all of a sudden, I saw one black guy. He came. And then he came right where I was. And then he greeted me in my mother tongue. <laughs> At first I thought, am I dreaming? Then he greeted me again in my mother tongue. Then he told me, do you know I'm your cousin? In my mother tongue. I said, it cannot be. <laughs> cousin from where? I, he said, I am your cousin. Then I said, how do you know that you are my cousin? He said, when I heard there is a, a community that is coming here in this community of ours and is from Kenya. I started inquiring, who are they? And I saw your name on the list. And I know you. You are my cousin. And he's speaking in vernacular. <laughs> Me, I was just nodding. I said, mm. <laughs> Of course, we settled down and we started talking. But let me tell you, the moment... He told me how related we were. And by the way, for real, we, were, we, we are related. His father and my mother are siblings. Meeting in a foreign land. All of a sudden, we forgot about white people. <laughs> and just we, and we started talking Swahili, whatever. He was asking me so many things about home and stuff. He told me how he went there to study and, and, and whatever. In fact, recently he was in my house. He has just relocated back to Kenya. He was in my house. And he was telling me, do you remember that experience? In a foreign land. Can you imagine in a foreign land, somebody comes and speaks to you in vernacular? You might say, the devil is a liar. <laughs> I don't know you. <laughs> but all of a sudden, there was a bond because he was speaking in a language that I could understand. So tell your neighbor one more time. Neighbor, neighbor. every language neighbor. has some significance. So every language has some significance. It identifies a group of, of, a group of people and intricately connects them with one another. Now, before all these languages came, in Genesis chapter 11, we see that everybody spoke one language. So you can tell how connected they were. You can tell how, you know, united they were. They were speaking only one language. So everybody understood each other. Can you imagine if Kenya, we only spoke one language? It would be a very united country. A very united country. Because we'll understand each other. Isn't it? So they spoke only one language. And as they spoke this one language, you can see that it was easy to rally the entire group, you know, towards one goal. It was very easy for them to talk about building. It was very easy for them to conceive their idea of building a city or building a tower because they were speaking one language. The ingredient of building requires that we speak one language. You are very quiet. Let me say that again. The ingredient of building requires that we speak one language. We must speak one language. The people were of one language, one speech. Everybody understood each other. That's why it was very easy for information to pass from one person to another concerning the building of the city or the building of the tower. So there is the language of the kingdom, ladies and gentlemen, that we need to have, each and every one of us, as children of God, for us to engage in building God's house. This language will connect us with one another. 
This language will rally us behind a common goal that we may be able to accomplish that which God has commissioned us to accomplish. When we understand this language, we form a very strong bond with one another. When we understand this language, we harness our diverse gifts, skills, and potential to accomplish kingdom assignments. It is this language that unites us to work for God. It is this assignment that makes each and every one of us to get excited concerning what God is commanding us to do. It is this language that unites our hearts, our souls, our minds, our hands together. It rallies us behind a common goal, and that is to fulfill that which God commands us to fulfill as his children. Touch your neighbor and tell them, I need to understand this language. So where do we find the language of the kingdom? We find the language of the kingdom in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 6. Put it on the screen. We read together. The Bible says, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching. Paul says, if I speak in tongues, you will not understand me. You will not understand what I'm saying. But if I speak to you by revelation, give me the scripture back. If I speak to you by revelation, or I speak to you by knowledge, or I speak to you by prophesying, or I speak to you by or through teaching, you will be able to understand. So the language of the kingdom is locked up in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 6. And we are going to break down this scripture so that you understand the language of the kingdom. So ladies and gentlemen, the language of the kingdom, number one, is the language of revelation. The language of the kingdom, which we need to speak as children of God, that we may rally behind the vision to build God's house, is the language of revelation. Somebody shout the language of revelation. Shout it louder, the language of revelation. You see, truth is available, but not accessible to everybody. A lot of people live in ignorance, not because of the absence of truth, but failure to access the truth that is already available to them. They haven't accessed the, they haven't accessed the truth that God has put in his word, you know, that is meant to catapult their lives to the next level, that is meant to open up their eyes to see the things that God will like them to see so that they may react accordingly. The truth is out there. The truth is in God's word. But you need revelation for you to access the truth. The truth must be revealed to you. The truth must be exposed to you. The truth has to come to the level of your understanding, but it will never happen until you have a revelation about the truth. What is revelation? Revelation simply means an act of revealing or communicating divine truth. So that means this truth has to be communicated to you. This truth has to be revealed to you. This truth has to be broken down to your level of understanding so that you may understand the language of the kingdom. Am I preaching to somebody in this house? So the more you sit under teachings, the more you sit under preachings, the more you sit under anointed solid teachings of the scriptures, of the word of God, the more you are able to access the truth that God has put out there in his word for us to be able to grasp so that we may react accordingly. If you don't understand the truth, you will not react accordingly. If you don't understand the truth, you will not act accordingly. If you don't understand the truth, you will not spring into action. 
Because you see, your mind has to be engaged before your body moves. Oh. Can I say that again? Your mind has to be engaged before your, mo- your body moves. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why you see, God gave you the mind. And that's why you realize that when you are not really convinced about something, you cannot move. Let me give you a very simple example. There's a time I broke my leg. Uh, My children took me, my children prevailed on me. Esav and Ashley, they prevailed on me to go to Panari for ice skating. I told them, I'm too old for these things. He said, no, 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 you're not old. It's in your mind, dad. It's in your mind. It's in your mind. So I said, okay, let's go. So we went. I tried to convince Pastor Mary to join us. She refused. (laughs) She said, me, I'll just watch you guys. So I wore the boots. We entered the place. The guy trained me a little bit. Then he said, I think you can do it. I said, yes, I think I can do it. But I was so surprised that my children were so good in it. Asaph and Ash, they were so good in it. I just could see them. They were just moving. They were gliding. I said, mm. <laughs> I can also do it. <laughs> I am their father. They cannot embarrass me like this before people. So I started gliding. Ooh, gliding, gliding. I go to a place. I forgot how to break. <laughs> Before I knew it, I was on the floor. Boom! I tried to wake up. I was wondering what's going on. I tried to wake up. I tried to stand on my feet. One leg was very weak. So I called for help. So the instructor there came. He told me, ah, we see these things every day. People fall down. We take them to our office. We spray the leg. Then they come back the following morning. So he told me, you know, tomorrow morning you'll be here. I said, me, (laughs) after falling down like this, in front of all these people. (laughs) I said, I'm not coming. So he took me to the office, removed the boots. Uh, Do you call them boots or what? Sky skating shoes or whatever. What do you call them, skates or whatever? And then he removed them. And then my, my, I, I looked at my leg, it was looking funny. He said, ah, this is something very small. He went and took deep hit, sprayed on my leg. And he was pressing. I said, Bo, you're hurting me. He said, no, 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 no. I'm helping you. Because tomorrow. <laughs> so I couldn't go back. I stayed there waiting for, I waited for my kids. When they were done, we went home. That night, I couldn't sleep. My, 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 my leg was just throbbing like this. The whole night, couldn't sleep. Anyway, cut the long story short. The following day, I had to go to the hospital. So I went to one hospital. He looked at me and said, no, 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 I cannot handle your case. I said, hey, is this this, this, this serious? He said, yeah, 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 come and see. I had taken some x-rays. He came and said, you see? Then he asked me, before before I tell you what I'm seeing here, when they were taking the x-ray, did your leg move? I said, no, it did not move. I was told to stay still, so I just stood still. He said, okay, when I look at here, I say, where? <laughs> he said, here, I'm seeing something. But because I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, I want to refer you to an orthopedic surgeon. So I ended up in, um, I think Aga Khan, the main, went to see an orthopedic surgeon. I arrived there at around 11. They took me to the section of the orthopedic surgeon. I was surprised. I met people who had broken bones until I said, mine is nothing. In fact, I started feeling like I'm healed. (laughs) Have you been to hospital, you see sick people, and then you say, I I don't think I'm that bad. I think I can go home. And when I stayed there from from 11, By the time I was seeing the orthopedic surgeon, it was 6 o'clock, going to 7 p.m. in the evening. Because apparently those people had booked. Me, I just came. So the guy called me in. I went in, and he asked me, hey, how are you? I said, I'm very, very fine. He said, you are not fine. (laughs) 
You know, sometimes you encourage yourself so the doctor cannot give you an injection or give you a lot of medicine, isn't it? They say, I'm fine. Look at me. Say, no, you are not fine. Come here. Say, look, you have a broken leg. I said, broken leg. He said, yes. Then he asked me, how did you come? I said, I drove myself and I'm driving myself back. He said, you're not driving yourself back. Get a driver. I asked him, doctor, please, between you and me. Ashley was there. I told Ashley, Abu, move. I said, doctor, is it serious? He said, it is very serious. And he told me, if you joke with it, next time you come back, I will break your leg myself to correct it and put you in a cast. In my heart, I was saying, I bind you, devil, in the name of Jesus. I pull you down. I capsize your boat in the name of Jesus. Send fire on you. Of course, I ended up in a cast. I think some of you remember. I was in a cast for, uh, for about five weeks. I used to preach while seated down. I couldn't drive. He gave me instructions, and he told me, go and take the instructions to your wife. <laughs> he even told me, I wish she was here. But in summary, go and tell your wife to give you VIP treatment. I say, So you should not do anything, you should not walk, she should drive you anywhere she, you want to go, she should take care of you, make sure you don't move at all, don't move the leg at all, she should take care of you. Wow. Anyway, after the five weeks, because I was in the cast for five weeks, I went back. Then he looked at me and said, ah, I've got good news for you. I said, what are the news? He said, I think you're okay. I said, you think? He said, yeah, I think you're okay. So I was seated on a bed. Then he told me, okay, can you come down? So I came down. I was still in the cast. He said, can you remove it? So I removed it. He said, now walk. He said, I have said walk. So I said, okay, give me the crutch. I used to use the crutch to walk. He said, give me the say, No, 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 without the crutch, walk. I told him I'm trying, but my mind is telling me I cannot walk. Then he told me, okay, go back. Go back to the bed. So I pushed myself to the bed. Do you know what he did? He came to the bed, grabbed me. <laughs> and pulled me to the floor. And he said, walk and go. That's how I left his office. You see, my leg had healed, but my mind was telling me, you still have a problem in your leg, and you cannot walk. You understand? And for several weeks, I used to walk, but still look at the leg and wonder, is it really healed? Because the mind was still trying to adjust to the fact that the leg was now healed. What am I trying to show you? Your mind is very powerful. The revelation has to hit your mind. Before your, body, before your body can move. The revelation has to hit your mind, transform your thinking. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind before your body can spring into action. Tell your neighbor, that's why you need revelation. <coughs> oh, they didn't hear you. Shout it in their faces. Tell them, that's why you need revelation. So we access the truth through revelation. It is what, it is what, that is revealed to you that causes you to spring into action. No matter how big, how huge, how impossible that task is, it has to be revealed to you. Now, what has God revealed to us? Because we are talking about the language of the kingdom as an ingredient of building. What has God revealed to us? The first thing that God has revealed to us, which is the thing that I will deal with before we finish, is the importance of building him a house. Tell your neighbor, get it in your head. 
God wants you to understand the importance of building him a house. Building him a place of worship. He wants us to know. He wants us to get this truth. He wants us to get this revelation because it is very, very important to him. When I started this church some 11 or so years ago, immediately I started having a vision and a burden to settle this church. The church was very small and we started walking around looking for land. I gathered a few guys and we're just walking around trying to look for land so we can be able to gather the church. From the very beginning, of, of, of the church. We couldn't find anything, but we kept on looking. We kept on looking. We kept on looking. And then the desire became very strong when I did a series on establishment. I don't know if you remember that series. I did a sermon series on establishment. And the desire to see the church established became even stronger. Because I talked about establishment. I talked about land. That is the time when we started now being very, very intentional about, you know, having our own land as a church. The desire was growing. And then the revelation became practical when I met Bishop Doug, Heward Mills. I remember, you know, I stumbled on his materials and I was reading his materials and I was very captivated. And then, of course, one time I was having a conversation with Pastor Jimmy and then he mentioned that he has gone to Ghana once and if I don't mind, I, we can go. So we planned and we went. So I went, and I was blown away by what I saw. The churches he has built, what he has established in that country. Then I discovered it was not only in that country. He's, he has churches all over, you know, the world. He even has a church here in this city. I even went to see the church, and I realized they have bought property. I said, how? A foreigner. Has a church here, bought property, established the church. They have built a cathedral in Mombasa. And I say, this man has something that I'm looking for. This man knows what I don't know. Let me try and follow him and see what will happen. So I went again to Ghana. And this time I told my host, please take me around. I want to see these churches he has built. We didn't even finish the churches he has built in Ghana the desire became even stronger. The revelation became even stronger. It's like God was revealing to me this revelation in a very deep way. Then I said, I want to meet him. So our meeting was arranged, and I met him. When I met him, I knew what I was going to say when I met him. I was going to tell him about what we are doing, how the church is growing. We are doing well. Our church is exploding in numbers. And I was with him. And I was telling him, oh, we are doing well. The church is doing very, very well. We are growing. We were in this small place. We moved and went to another place. And now we have two services. The church is growing. I'm telling you, the area is feeling us. And he's just listening to me. Then I realized at some point he was not impressed by what I was saying. So I slowed down. You know, when you're before a great man and you talk a lot, also check the face. To see. So I, I realized he's not getting excited. So I slowed down. Then I waited for him to speak. Then he asked me, have you bought land for the church? It's like everything I said <laughs> did not impress him. I said, no. He said, go and buy land. That was the end of our meeting. <laughs> Let me tell you, I felt very small. I wondered now, you, you know, sometimes you hit yourself, you with your big mouth. <laughs> what were you saying? I felt very embarrassed. But I took it as a challenge. And I came back with a renewed zeal to be able to buy land. When we bought land, he came to Tanzania. So I went, I said, this time, <laughs> when he asked me that question, I know what to answer. So we were with him in Tanzania there. We did the crusade. After the crusade, you know, he said, can, 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 I, can I talk to you? I said, wow, what a privilege. He said, I, then he asked me, so how are you doing? He said, hey, we're doing very well. We have even bought land. He was not excited. <laughs> I wondered, what excites this man? Then he said, have you built? I said, we are... We are in the 
in the process. He told me, go and build. That was the end of the conversation. Last year, he came to Kenya. I was trading carefully when I was around him. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, once beaten. So this time, I was not talking a lot. It was very quiet. We took him from the airport. We went. We took him to one of the hotels. He refreshed. And after that, you know, before he went to the car, I went to greet him. And we were talking there. You know, he was asking me, how's Kenya? I told him how Kenya was, how things are moving. He told me, you must be happy with the new president. I said, yes. Yeah, we are hoping things will change. You know, I was liking the conversation. Because <laughs> I didn't want the conversation to go the other direction. <laughs> Then before you go to the car, you say, by the way, I am coming to see your building. I said, yes, by faith, yes. You are coming in Jesus' name to see the building. So every time I'm around him, he provokes me. He provokes me. The revelation is exploding more when I'm around him. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the truth is out there, but it has to be revealed to you. Because if it's not revealed to you, you will never spring into action. Ask your neighbor, are you catching it so far? Ask them again, are you getting it? Are you getting it? So it has to be revealed to you. And when it is revealed to you, then you are able to spring into action. Can we go a little bit deeper? When you look at what is happening in our churches today, it's a very sad scenario. That every time a church begins to build, because members don't have a revelation of building, they leave the church. Every time there's a project to buy land, to build the church, people leave. And they go to established churches. They wait until the project is done for them to be able to come back. It's because they don't have a revelation. They don't understand the truth that God wants them to access as far as building his house is concerned. So look at them and tell them, I hope you're not leaving. I hope you have, not packed, you have not packed your bags, ready to go. So the revelation has to, be, has to be with you. The revelation has to explode in your heart. The revelation has to explode in your spirit. You must understand that God wants us to build. And I pray that the same burden, the same passion, the same desire that I have for the building of God's house, the same revelation I have for the building of God's house, I pray that the same revelation will be with you. Shout a louder, amen. amen. I pray that it may capture you. I pray that it may fill your mind. It may fill your soul. You may sleep dreaming about the house of God. Can I hear louder, amen? amen. Lay your hands on your neighbor and tell them, I transfer the same passion. I transfer the same desire. I transfer the same burden that is the heart of our pastor concerning the building of God's house in your heart in the name of Jesus. Tell them, receive it in Jesus' name. I prophesy you will dream about building God's house. I prophesy you will think about building God's house. I prophesy that is what you will talk about every now and then. Shout a louder amen in this house. Lift your hands and say, I receive the revelation to build God's house. Shout amen. amen. Sit down. So no member, no member who has this revelation can fight a building project. No member who has this revelation can become stingy when it comes to building God's house. No member who has this revelation can brew suspicion and strife when the church is involved in the building of God's house. When you have this revelation, you will support this noble cause. Amen. Amen. So this revelation is in the word of God. The language of revelation is in the word of God. That is in Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1. Let's go there quickly. Haggai chapter 1. Haggai Chapter number one. Are you still with me? Have I lost you or we are together? Only three people said we are together. The rest? 
Are, are we together or we are lost? Beautiful. Haggai chapter 1. The Bible says, in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiah, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, verse 2, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, this people, says, the time has not come. That means they didn't have a revelation concerning the building of God's house. They say, this time, the time rather, has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then verse 3, then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, the revelation came through the prophet saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Verse 6, you have sown so much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into, into a bag with holes. Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up. That is the remedy. Go up. Where? To the mountains. And bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. The people were struggling. The people were poor. But they didn't know the cause of their poverty. And a prophet brings revelation. <laughs> a prophet speaks to them the truth and he tells them the reason why we are, we, you are struggling, the reason why you are poor, the reason why you are not doing well in life is because you have neglected the house of God. Tell your neighbor, what a revelation. Tell them one more time, what a revelation. What a revelation. Not everything will be solved by prayer and fasting. Not everything will be solved by prayer and fasting. Some things are solved simply because you bought cement for the house of God. Mm. Thank you for those who are clapping. I should call you in one corner and preach to you because you're understanding what I'm saying. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? Some of the problems in your life will be solved when you build the house of God. Look. As we are building God's house, I want you to know is an opportunity for some of the issues in your life to be resolved. Tell your neighbor, it's a revelation. You didn't understand that. Tell them, it's a revelation. This is the language of the kingdom. It's a revelation. Some of you, by building God's house, you'll drive a car. By building God's house, you'll build your own house. By building God's house, you will get married. By building God's house, you'll get children. Can I get a better amen in this house? It's a revelation. It has to be revealed to you. Because if it's not revealed to you, you will say, ah, it's a waste of money. I'd rather take my money to Red Cross. I'd rather take my money to a children's home somewhere and help the kids who don't have food. It's because you don't understand the revelation behind building God's house. It has to Shift your mind, shift your thinking so that you understand that this is an opportunity for God to take my life to the next level. They struggled, they worked so hard, they could drink, but they were not uh, fulfilled. They could eat, but they were not satisfied. They could clothe themselves, but they were still feeling cold simply because they had neglected the house of God. Ladies and gentlemen, us being in this tent, if we decide we're going to be in this tent forever, there is a certain level of prosperity we will never see in our lives. Maybe some of us, we will never even build a house. Because building is not easy. You need the help of God to build. Tell me, but you need God. You know, there are people who say, oh, you don't need God to prosper. You don't need God to do this. Oh, you don't need God. I even had another foolish preacher saying that you don't need God to prosper. You are foolish if you're listening to me. You are a fool. I need to educate you. It is he who gives us power. 
and he's mentioning, oh, Bill Gates does not worship God and he's rich. Oh, Sijui who does not worship God and he's rich. God can tell Bill Gates today, you fool, I require your soul. It's done. Or God can say from today, become poor. He will be poor today. Look at the way you're looking at me. It's like, huh? Really? Tell your neighbor, it's a revelation. It's a revelation. One day there was a king who was boasting how he has become a king. And he's boasting. He's walking around, looking at his kingdom. And he says, look at me. Then God says, eh. Okay, today, from now, start walking like an animal. May your skin be filled with fur. May your brain be reduced to that of an animal. May you not be able to communicate the way human beings communicate. And the guy became an animal, and he had to leave the palace to go to the wild. Don't joke with God. Don't just say, I will do without God. I've seen people who have done without God. It is God who has extended his mercies in their lives. Because without him, you are nothing. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So if you kill your preacher, check your doctrine and check your theology. We need God. We need God. We need God. You need God. You need the power to do it. You need the grace to do it. You need the mercies of God to do it. Without him, you can do nothing. That's why he says, look, you want me to prosper you? Build my house. Be involved in building my house. And when you build my house, I'll be able to prosper you. Tell your neighbor, get ready for prosperity. Tell another one, get ready for increase. As we build, may God lift us up. As we build, may God prosper us. As we build, may God lift us. As we build, may we see breakthrough upon breakthrough upon breakthrough taking place in our lives in the name of Jesus. As we build, may doors be open for us. As we build, may elevation come our way. As we build, may increase and prosperity be our portion. Shout a louder, amen. Look at the neighbor and tell them, I must build God's house because it's a revelation to me. So how did people respond? Did, which verse did we reach? Verse 8. Jump to verse 12 to 14. Verse 12. Alphas lived that fish. You. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of God. Verse 13. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. Then verse 14. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came. And what did they do? They worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Four great responses that we see from the people. I want to throw this to you and then we pray. Number one, they obeyed the voice of God. And they obeyed the words of Haggai the prophet. They obeyed the voice of God because the voice of God comes to us through the man of God. They heard the voice of God through the words of the prophet and they aligned themselves with the voice of God and when they aligned themselves with the voice of God, their response was appropriate. Secondly, they feared his presence. They were filled with reverence. They knew that God is speaking to us and so they were filled with reverence and awe. Fear gripped these people, and this is the fear of God. And they say, hey, we must do this. We can't live in beautiful houses, and the house of God lays in or lies in ruin. They were consumed with the fear of God. Number three, 
They were stirred up. The spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, the governor of Judah, was stirred up. The spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, was stirred up. And the spirit of all the remnant of the people was also stirred up. Everybody received a stirring. I pray that everybody here, you will receive a stirring to build the house of God. May your spirit be stirred up. May your heart be stirred up. May your mind be stirred up. And may your body as well be stirred up. Let me add, may your wallet be stirred up as well. Hallelujah. That we may be able to build the house of God. Because to stir simply means to arouse to activity. Hallelujah. To do what? To arouse to activity. Praise the Lord. Is the way you arouse a woman. Because it's not easy to arouse a woman. It's hard. The first thing in the mind of a man is sex. The last thing in the mind of a woman is sex. So you can see that the man is the far end. The woman is at the far end. And they have to meet in the middle. But because the woman is not moving, the man has to travel. <laughs> Pastor Zef, are you with me? He has to travel. He has to become an explorer. Travel and go and reach where the woman is. And say, hey baby, there's a journey I want us to take. And he begins to talk to her. Begins to tell her things. That's why you see many women at the beginning of a relationship, they are always saying no. They are always saying, I don't see it working. Sioni. I always make Sidani. He ain't a work. Sitaki. Sikupendiata. Sikufil. And the man comes back. Say, so let's just take one step. You can only a coffee. Sour. I can do joy. Sipo feel. Tell your neighbor, then the journey begins. By the time she arrives, if you ask her, she says, Actor, see you in Nili. Miss Jushetani Ganili Ningia. The way they explain, you get surprised. It's because the man took her on a journey. On a journey. All these wives talk to them. They will tell you the first time the husband came. He was not my type. When did he become your type? Atasijui. Akima penzi wewe. It took a journey. I see very spiritual people who don't relate to the stories I give about love. But it's fine. It took a journey. They had to be aroused. They had to be stirred up. You understand what I'm saying? So when the word of the Lord came, people's hearts were stirred up. Initially, they were not aroused. Initially, they were not excited about it. Initially, they said, ah, we are in this content. We are okay. But when the word of God came, they were aroused. May you be aroused to build the house of God. May you be stirred up to build the house of God. Shout a louder, amen. amen. And the last thing, they worked on the house of God. Verse 14 says, they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. They worked on it. They built it. They worked on it. They decided we are going to build the way we have decided we are going to build the house of God. I wish I can get people who can agree with me that, Pastor, we are ready to work on the house of God. We are going to build the house of God. The revelation is exploding in our hearts. We are beginning to see the truth that we must build God's house. They worked on it and worked on it and worked on it and worked on it until they were able to finish. Praise the Lord. I pray that you will respond like these guys. 
We shall respond like this congregation. We shall build the house of God. If you believe it, shout amen. amen. Somebody give a hand or clap to Jesus. If you feel aroused, give him praise and a shout.